Good morning. Boy, it's been a while since I've been here on a Sunday morning. Feels weird. I can't remember ever missing two Sunday mornings in a row in a long time. But I did have a good vacation, so I don't get many of those either. So I guess I got to take them when I can get them. So I missed you guys. So it's good to be back. So this morning, we're going to be in Philippians. What a shock. We've been there for a few weeks. We're still there. So we're going to be, we're going to start chapter 3 in Philippians, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, um, like I've already been read once. And I was excited to know that this was the, the section that, that I, I was, I don't know if the word assigned is the word I'm looking for, but the section of Scripture that fell to me as Tim was on vacation. Because I really like this section of Scripture, and it's, it's kind of an encouragement to me, and I really just enjoy it. So we're going to talk about this this morning. So here in chapter 3 of Philippians, you know, Paul is coming out hard against some false teachings. So there's been some teachings flying around that, that you have to do something other than have faith in Christ for your salvation. And Paul's going to come in here and he's going to say, no, that's not, not what happens here. That's not how this works. And he's going to tell us that we don't have to work our way to salvation. That we don't have to work our way to salvation. And our, our faith, Christianity, minus a couple of denominations, but we won't get into that, has something different than any other religion in the world. And that's, we don't have to work our way to salvation. It's a gift that Christ has promised us. Buddhist, Hindu, Islam, Scientology, even Judaism. You have to do something to earn your salvation. You have to do something to make your way to God. Not, not what Paul's going to teach us here. In fact, he's going to tell us that it's not what we do, it's what Christ did that gets us our salvation. That it's Christ's work, not ours. So he takes this idea of you have to do something to earn your salvation or do something to earn your right to be with God. And he's going to turn that whole idea upside down. And he's going to say, actually, it's what God did for you that gets you there. But before we dig in here, let's, uh, let's start with a little bit of prayer. And then we'll, then we'll talk about what Paul really wanted us to, to see from these verses. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. And Father, we just thank you for your word, Lord, and the gifts you've given us, Father, and that you just love us that much, that you love us so much that you would send your son to die for us. Father, I just pray that you just uh, speak through me this morning, that they be your words, not mine. And Lord, that you just open the hearts of those that can hear to what you would have them learn, Father. We just love you and we praise you this morning, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, Paul starts off with a warning. He tells us to watch out. Watch out for these false teachings. Verses 1 through 3 say, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in in the flesh. So Paul kind of viewed himself with the, the Philippians as kind of as a spiritual father in a sense. Because Paul is the one who came to Philippi and started preaching the gospel and started teaching them about Christ and brought the original and, and was there, you know, the first person to tell him, hey, Christ died for you. So he put a lot of effort into the, the, the people of Philippi. And he truly cared for them. He truly loved them. And he wanted to do whatever he could do to protect them. And because of that, he's writing this letter to them. And he wanted to make sure that he warned them. Because there was all kinds of, of false doctrine and false teachings at this time. Today we're going to be talking about a specific teaching that, that Paul addresses here. 
So Paul's main concern with the Philippian church was, was a group called Judaizers. And one of the things Judaizers taught was that the Gentiles, so the people who have never been Jewish in their life that have converted to Christianity, before they could truly be saved or truly find that salvation in Christ, that they had to be circumcised like the Jewish people. How the Jewish law said on the eighth day, all males of your, your family have to be circumcised as a, as a sign of the covenant with God. Well, Paul's going to say, I don't think so. That's adding to what, what Christ taught us. That's adding to, to faith in Christ alone. That circumcision is not, not needed for the Gentile converts to truly have a faith in Christ. And you can look back at Acts 15, 1 to see where Paul talks, or where actually Luke, sorry, not Paul, Luke talks about it a little more. But Paul's going to use some strong language to describe these false teachers and these false teachings. And he calls them dogs, evildoers, and mutilators of the flesh, and warns us to avoid these people. Now, I just want to look at the word dogs here for a minute. Now, one of the reasons I like Paul is Paul's a little sarcastic. And if you look at this term dogs, he's actually being sarcastic. Because what a lot of Jewish people who did not like the Gentiles called them, they called them dogs. Because to the Jewish people and to people of the time, dogs weren't pets. Dogs weren't pets. They were scavengers. They, at best, guarded your house or your flock. You didn't feed them. They found food wherever they ate out of the trash. So they were unclean animals. So that was a very derogatory term that they would use to call Gentiles. So Paul's saying, stop this. They don't have to be circumcised. And then Paul turns around and tells us what the true circumcision is. Verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So Paul is telling us that our salvation is not based on something we do to our body, not something we do outwardly. It's something we do inwardly. It's a decision we've made in our heart. It's not mutilating our flesh as Paul puts it in these verses. It's putting all our trust in Christ and knowing that it's only through what he did for us that salvation comes. That only through his perfect life and death on the cross that our punishment could be fulfilled. We could never fulfill our own punishment. So first Paul tells us to watch out. Watch out for these false teachings. Next, Paul kind of warns us to watch out for ourself. Don't put our faith in ourself or what we can do. Don't put your confidence in that. Verses 4 through 7 read, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So if anyone had the right to brag about what they've done in their life, it was Paul. It was Paul. He followed the law. He was circumcised on the eighth day like Jewish law taught. He was a member of the Israelites. He was born into the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. Pharisees were kind of a big deal back then. They were kind of part of the leadership of the Jewish church. I guess we'll call it a church right now. Kind of the Jewish community. Because they were so so stout in their beliefs and they knew so much that people followed them. And Paul was such a good Pharisee that he had spent, the major he had spent all of his life before his conversion on the Damascus Road 
persecuting the church that he now loves and is warning and trying to protect. He spent his whole life persecuting them. He was there when they stoned Stephen. He was faithful to the Old Testament law. He was found blameless, he would put it, as to the Old Testament law. So let's think about this today. Let's think, how would I put this if, if maybe Paul was talking in today's language? Because, you know, what's the tribe of Benjamin? But it'd be kind of like today if I said, well, after I was saved, I was baptized. And I was saved at a young age. And then I was baptized. Well, my dad was also a pastor. My dad was also a pastor. Now maybe I'm a pastor. And now I always pray and tithe. That's kind of what Paul is saying in our, in our terms. I do everything that I'm supposed to do. I do everything that I've been taught I'm supposed to do, and that is what has gained my salvation. And Paul's going to say, no. I count all of this long list of things that aren't bad things as loss. I don't count them as worth anything because of the knowledge of Christ, because of what Christ did for me. Paul tells us that all this stuff is useless if we don't have a relationship with Christ. So none of this is bad stuff. None of it's bad. But if we don't know Christ, it's useless. Jesus is the key to our salvation. Jesus is the key to our salvation. And he's so important. So first, Paul tells us to watch out for others. Second, Paul tells us to watch out for ourselves. Because we have this bad habit of thinking we can do things ourselves. We can work our way to salvation. And Paul tells us here, no, we can't. We cannot work our way to salvation. That only the key to salvation is Jesus. And third, he's going to tell us that it's only, in fa it's only faith in Jesus that leads us to heaven. Only faith in Christ gets us where we need to go. So verses 8 through 11. He's going to kind of repeat himself in the first verse and then go on to tell us a little bit more. Which is, how, which is just how much he, he's trying to tell us that he doesn't count all of this other stuff in his life that he once did. He doesn't count it important anymore. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ... And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and, him, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead." So like I said, Paul was a highly respected leader among the Jewish people, and he spent a lot of time persecuting the church. But all of this stuff, all of this stuff, that he once loved so much, he counted it as rubbish. He counted it as garbage, is another way to, to word that. So this man who was once loved by all these Jewish people doesn't care that he is now hated by them. Does not care that he is now hated by them because they feel like he turned on them. They feel like he has turned his back on the Jewish people. And he doesn't care. Paul regrets nothing. Because Paul knows the truth. Paul knows that it's only through Christ that we gain our salvation. 
only through Christ. Paul lost everything to follow Jesus. Paul lost everything to follow Jesus. And I have a feeling he would do it again and again and again. Because he realized how unimportant it is. That Jesus is the important part. The faith in Christ he gained was all he needed. He didn't need all the stuff. He didn't need all the titles. He didn't need all of the Jewish law. He needed Christ. He knew that no matter what he did, he himself could never gain that salvation that he was working towards. He could never gain that. That it was only through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that he could gain what he was looking for. And that was to be found righteous in God's eyes. Only through Jesus could that happen. Our faith in Jesus is what we need. Now does that mean that, okay, all I need is my faith in Jesus. I don't have to do anything else. Technically. Technically. However, the Bible also teaches that us that because of our faith in Christ, there should be fruit. There should be fruit. So we should be all gung-ho about working for Jesus. We should be gung-ho for telling others about Him, for serving Him, for serving others. Jesus was a great example. He served others while He was on earth. And likewise, we should serve others. We should be serving in our churches. We should be serving among our communities. We should be serving. And that's because we understand how important our relationship with Jesus is. How important it should be for us to want everyone to know how important that relationship is. Because we should be like God. And we should want everyone to come to know about Him, about Christ. That should be our want. The power of Christ comes from faith in Him, not in anything we can do. There's power in His name. And it's not because of anything we did, it's because of what He did. It's because of what he did, and because of that, we should want to do things for him. So first, Paul tells us to watch out. Be careful. There's people out here teaching crazy things. That hasn't changed in 2,000 years. There's still people out there teaching crazy things. And there'll always be people out there teaching crazy things. Follow what the Bible says. Don't follow what they say. Follow what the Bible say, says. Don't follow what they say. I will tell you that even while I'm standing up here, check what I said. Make sure what I said follows what the Bible says. Don't just trust me that I'm telling you the right thing. I feel like I'm telling you the right thing, but double check me. Because people, we make mistakes. God's word doesn't. We cannot put our faith in ourselves. Once again, we're people. We can't gain our salvation. We mess up. We mess up all the time. At least I do. If you don't, then 
I'm proud of you, but I mess up all the time. We can only gain righteousness before God through Christ. Not anything we can do. And it's through faith in Jesus alone that we can gain that righteousness. We have to have a faith in Him and a relationship with Him. A relationship with Him. Can you, can you have a relationship with someone you never talk to? No. You can say you do, but it's not really a relationship if you're not talking. It's not really a relationship if you're not talking to people. Paul tells us what we need to know here. That it's not what we do, it's what he did, what Christ did for us. And that what we have to do is come to a knowledge of him and a faith in him. And now's a time in our service where we like to just take some time and, you know, if God's working in your life, listen to him. Listen to him. You know, we have, a, we have a problems listening sometimes. I know I have a listening problem a lot. But listen to him. And you can take care of that at your seat. You can take care of that up here. You can come talk to me. I'll be up here if you need anything. So now it's just that time. You know, Pastor Don's going to come up here and lead us in some music. That if, if God's working in your life, deal with it. Do, what, do what, God's, what God's telling you to do because it's important or he wouldn't be saying it. So thank you.